uh, in early modernity as a way of criticizing the, the Lumiere sense that the methods of natural science could be adequate to analyzing and describing political life. And the thing, of course, really picks up with the French Revolution and with Burke, and um, you know, for whom natural organisms have a rich intelligibility precisely by virtue of not being designed from Cartesian scratch. So once you get to Schiller, Schelling, Coleridge, and all of these romantics, the organic state becomes a stock way of uh, talking about what the, what the liberal view of you know, the procedural state as a purely rational or, volition, or volitional agreement can capture or can't get to. And uh, just as a side note, I mean, I think this is connected to what Mark was saying yesterday about Williams on liberalism and the fact that it may be that there's something about liberalism itself or about some of its influential versions that can't or must refuse to think of itself as rooted and contingent and historically conditioned. Um, just to add one more reference to what I have in the paper, um, you know, that I came across this just in the past week that I was reminded of the fact that the oldest, you know, program of German idealism itself goes on this kind of rant about uh, uh, there's no more an idea of the state than there is an idea of the machine. The state is something mechanical that treats free human beings as if they were cogs. And it ends by saying we must go beyond the state. So I think this too makes it all the more interesting that Hegel, you know, ended up in the position of saying that the beyond the state was um, uh, or sorry, that, that, the, that the organic state was itself like a further iteration of thinking about that injunction to go beyond the state in the 1790s. Um, I mean, yeah, in the paper, I do a lot of preliminary expectorating about what uh, is meant by the notion of spirit. And I think I can skip over that um, in your company, but then I kind of focus on three features of the account in the philosophy of right that seem to me most relevant and uh, salient in thinking about Hegel's persistent uh, uh, yeah, nomenclature. Um, the first is that it matters that the ethical life of the state be a given, coherent, and autonomous whole, just like language. So the spirit of a nation must permeate all relations within it and cannot simply be made. Um, I think this too can be resolved into two uh, principles. The first is that we can speak of one form connecting the practice of the mundane to a figurative conception of what's unconditionally significant. So in other words, you could no more have a state comprised merely of strategic self-interested utility function maximizing agents than you could have a language that lacked the word for God. Um, and the other side of this is that these forms are not the sorts that could be voluntarily adopted. Uh, I think Hegel sees an infinite regress issue, right? That uh, because states are themselves the conditions under which an agent might think of herself as making the choice and so on. Um, the second general feature that I think is present in the philosophy of right is more ambitious is the thought that uh, Hegel sees these living holes as internally articulated and oriented toward formal functions that constitute their purpose. So I think this is the heading under which he refers to the rational organism as the mode of necessity. He says, uh, the spirit is a process within itself, which is internally articulated, and which posits differences within itself through which it completes the cycle. And he compares it explicitly to the way in which animals and plants are internally driven to articulate their organic functions. Um, I think this too can be resolved into three, you know, less fanciful statements. But first, that states exercise different powers and functions. Second, that it's possible to say something about what these are and should be such that we can tell when they are missing uh, or ask how they're exercised in different regimes. And third, that states are nonetheless something more than just aggregates of these functions. So I think um, here too, the, you know, the, the foil of this view is the, what I've called the Hegel's Humpty Dumpty criticism of liberalism, that it can't account for that through which all the parts communicate um, or for what uh, motivates the different parts being what they are. Um, and I think uh, it's also clear from this that it, uh, Mikhail Wolf has an article uh, about this, that the idea of political organism is not just the cause of the organization of the state, but the ground of the correct understanding of it. Um, 
Uh, but now the third feature of what seems like Hegel ascribes the state as living unity is that it be self-conscious or aware of itself as such. And this is a train of thought that shows up in 272 through 274. Um, the state is the world which the spirit has created for itself. The state is as far above physical life as spirit is above nature. He also says that spirit is actual only as that which it knows itself to be. And he adds, I guess a little earlier, uh, that the state has a soul which animates it. And this animating soul is subjectivity. Um, now, on some level, it's of course obvious that unlike natural entities, spiritual entities are only alive by virtue of being espoused or uh, by having agents committed to them. And that this is what makes spiritual entities more alive even, uh, we would say, than biological entities. But um, I think there's a question about what that awareness is supposed to be or where it's supposed to reside within the state. How is it that the state um, is to be is to know itself or be aware of itself. Um, and I entertain the thought that it's patriotism, but I think patriotism is not actually a good candidate for uh, self-consciousness because Hegel in his description of patriotism stresses uh, the fact that it's like a volitional second nature um, that uh, you know is distinctive precisely by not being conscious or aware of itself as such all the time. Um, and yeah, I, I think I want to say that, you know, the only context that elicits the full consciousness of the state as a rational organism is the state's notional relation or contrast to other such organisms. Uh, that is a view of one's state as a species belonging to an international or historical genus. Uh, it says in 323, this negative relation of one state to another is the state's own highest moment. Its actual infinity is the ideality of everything finite within it. And he says later that the state is an individual um, and negation is an essential component of individuality. So in other words, uh, the state is only fully conscious of itself, um, or I should say the citizens are only fully conscious of the state um, as such uh, within the latent or overt possibility of war with other states. Um, and Obviously, there's, you know, uh, a lot of qualification. Hegel places a lot of qualifications around this, and it's obvious that he doesn't think that all war is good or rational or healthy or world historical. But he does seem to see it as internal to the notion of the state as organism. Now, but I think Hegel's point also kind of paradoxically rests on appeal to the presence of a spiritual order that's higher than the state, namely, on a view from world and from history. So, I mean, it's clear that all kinds of nationalisms assume comparison to other states. Like to be this state conscious of itself, I have to think of my state as a species within a genus, either as the state with a manifest destiny or as a state among um, equal such others. But because and to the extent Hegel sees the state as uh, expressing an end that's higher than itself, and its sacred status as an individual state, also entails reference to history's court of judgment or the march of God in the world. So it's actually only possible to embody my own state's consciousness absolutely through a recognition of its relativity. So war is in a sense only the practical demonstration of what's philosophically available to the owl's eye view of world history, or the awareness of the partiality of one's commitments as both necessarily partial and as belonging to wider theater. Um, now I think this theater, itself has two tacit aspects, a national and a historical, which I won't uh, describe here, but the upshot is the thought that nations are organic and discrete units or laws unto themselves, and that that thought is itself logically dependent on and required by a conception of the universal undertaking to which they belong. So nations are only organic wholes because they are spirits agents, but they that, but the ultimate part they play is only ever philosophical, that is, you know, retrospective in the sense that it's not available to the self-understanding of each nation as such. So the justification for the state as an organism cannot be fully contained within the self-awareness of the state itself, which is only ever partial. So, I mean, this is, yeah, kind of paradox that the full justification of the state undermines the justification of the state as ultimate. And I, I take this to be a version of a recurring paradox about uh, naturalism, right? That higher forms of consciousness come into view 
in the awareness of their own partiality or incompleteness. Um, now, I think this maybe ends up in a strange position. That is that it's a condition of the organic unity of the state that it must be aware of itself as a rational form, but also that it can't fully be aware of itself as such a form. Um, and so in the paper, I sort of separate these two questions of what it would mean to answer the, the for itselfness of the state as a rational organism and the in itselfness. Um, so the, the for itself part is why it's important, why Hegel might think that it's important for citizens within the state, you know, to think of the state in this way. And uh, a sort of hunch I have, which isn't well worked out in the paper, is that it's meant to address something about the problem of romantic individualism that motivates the transition from morality to ethical life. That is that if authenticity or romantic individualism is the single most Im important thorn that motivates the transition to ethical life, then we should take seriously the thought that the organic state is meant to be answerable to the desire for wholeness that romantic individualism promises. Um, now that's even if or especially since Hegel didn't foresee the destructive possibilities um, of such a state, but um, I think it's, it's in touch with that issue. But then, yeah, the, the final question is why it might be in philosophy, you know, in the philosophies in itself, you important to think of uh, the state as a rational organism. And here, I help myself to, um, again, to Terry's um, naturalism book um, by saying that the organic state is uh, critical theoretical. Uh, that is that it offers a view of the best form that our commitment to the state would have to take for modern politics to be rational to the extent that it stands a chance to be. And to the extent that it does not, it's the only way of telling you know, where the deviations lie. And I think as Pinkert says in his book, um, this is how Hegel understands the amphibious character of modern agency, that we inhabit two practically heterogeneous worlds, the wholeness of which can only be fully realized in the idea of them. So the notion of organic unity is our only real measure of a communal whole. Uh, it's a touchstone that doesn't exist as such, but doesn't need to in order to be actual. And uh, I would add that to the extent to which this registers as a disappointing conclusion, only kind of corroborates the peculiar demands that we make on theory or on, the, on our theory of the state. Um, um, at the end of the paper, I talk about, you know, some of the ways in which we're no longer living within the material conditions of Hegel's world. Um, I mean, conspicuously, the fact that war isn't really possible in the nuclear age or shouldn't be, or uh, we'll only be having Hegel seminars so long as it is impossible. Um, and that, I think, throws... Um, you know, a big spanner in the works. Um, second, yeah, I think, uh, um, yeah, I just talk a little bit about how rationalization and reason have come to seem like completely different things to us and how, uh, and I hope this will connect to Lydia's paper too, how Hegel's notion of rationality presupposes a kind of um, uh, a society of, of the printed word um, and, now that we no longer primarily live in such a society, there's a question about how to think about the state. But I think, yeah, the upshot is that um, all of these uh, differences between the is and the ought uh, speak to Hegel's currency rather than to his obsolescence. That is that um, this, this kind of conflict or variance is itself part of our amphibious nature, uh, which, you know, as, as Terry puts it, it's the mark of amphibians that they can live on both sides of the line. So it's not as if uh, we've simply left Hegel behind in this regard. That's what I got. Thank you, uh, Tom. Uh, so uh, those with raised hands will get to ask questions. And the first of those is Mark. It's a great paper, Anton. I enjoyed it a great deal. Um, I want to ask you a question about, uh, like, I guess, non-ideal theory in Hegel, or, or in reality. So, like, one of the ways I, I like the way you broke up, broke down some of the claims that Hegel's making, and like one of them you were talking about that states exercise different functions, um, which which points to like I was say, there's two ways of thinking about like what's role organicism is playing in his thought, and one of them is that like we're aiming at an organic form. But I was thinking that there's also some sense in Hegel, or there might be, I wonder if you could speak to this, what, what, that even a defective state has to exercise those functions. And so I was wondering about Hegel's legacy on the 
you know, to the, I don't know, the human sciences or to sociology, where, where like what you're looking for is not so much organicism as a guide to a normative political ideal, but organicism as like a necessary hypothesis in understanding the complex functions of a given society, the kind of thing you see in like Parsons and Luhmann and Habermas and, and Durkheim too. And that latter like descriptive function, I mean, more descriptive function that organi or organic metaphors play. It also seems like it's, as I said, it's what makes possible like some of like, you know, Fred Neuhauser thinking on social pathologies, we're borrowing from Durkheim here. And so I'm wondering if you could say something about like in Hegel, do you have a sense as to how much those functions are going to exist even in non-ideal non -ideal states? I know there's just so little evidence that I know about this that I know it's a hard question, um, but, that, but that's my question, so. Wait, sorry, so you're asking how useful the, you know, let's say the, the division of powers might be when thinking about a state that seems not to have such a division or... Yeah, and what I'm wondering about is it, how committed is Hegel, like not to the question of whether an ideal state would be organic, to, but, to the, but to, the, to a model yeah. that any state has to have these functions to some degree or other. And, and like the reason yeah. I'm interested in that question, because I'm also interested in, well, how you identify those functions, whether you can use the idea to do so. But, I, but I'm sort of, but I don't know even the basic question as to how deeply committed he is to organicism as a necessary framework for the approach to any like, you know, complex human community. Yeah, no, I, um, I mean, my only kind of coherent thought is that uh, this, this criterion about, let's say the division of powers, right, which seems like the, the clearest version of this. Um, uh, it's, it's what Hegel has instead of a kind of Aristotelian regime theory, right, where it looks like, um, you know, there are these four or five or six types of regimes and anything else can fall within them. And there's a sense in which um, Hegel, I mean, he's inheriting something like that from Montesquieu, but the thing that plays that role like within the framework of the modern state seems to be a kind of discrimination of um, how, uh, yeah, institutional powers are distinct from each other. Um, uh, but no, I think, I think that's, that's quite an interesting question to which I, I don't have a better answer. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is Arash. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you for very interesting talk. So uh, I have a question about the importance of war for Hegel, because uh, if we accept that w war is a kind of essential ingredient, essential conceptual ingredient of the concept of the state for Hegel, and then we accept that war is not an option right now, even it was not an option at the time of Hegel. I mean, perhaps he had like Roman or Greek people in mind, but I don't think that he even was an option for him. But, but just, uh, uh, but the point is, so it poses a problem for his entire philosophy because the state is the highest, organ the highest uh, manifestation of a spirit. It depends on war for its actualization. War is impossible, therefore the philosophy of right is failure. I mean, if one follows the argument, uh, so it's, it's just one cannot say that we can, I mean, I just want to say the essentiality of war for him is important. If we take that essentiality uh, like necessary, then it, it will have some consequences for his work. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I mean, I. Um... One way to kind of, uh, you know, wish it away would be to say that in the same way that I don't need to struggle to the death with the people around me for recognition, um, states don't need to go to war anymore in order to kind of like settle world historical principles, right? Um, I mean, I think, yeah, there is, I'm not sure, I guess, why you think that Hegel doesn't see war as important in his own time. I mean, there's lots of passages kind of in the, certainly in the early writings that suggest that he, he thinks that war is a kind of renewing principle of states, that is that oh, states fall uh, into a kind of entropy. Well, of, course, uh, of course he believes that, I think, but he, he's not entitled to believe that, uh, even at his time. I mean, of course he believes that, I don't, uh, that, uh, of course that's the things that war is important for him, but, 
But I don't think that even at his own time, he was not entitled to have that, uh, that idea of war. Yeah. Sorry, what do you mean entitled? Which means that there's no justification for it. I mean, he, he has this principle of war from like ancient Greek or Roman time. Uh, in that period, yes, there was like, because uh, war could give some kind of renovation, uh, like rejuvenation of Zitlishkeit. But uh, in modern world that there's this deep commercial culture, I don't think that like nobody cares about, I mean, that's different principle, but when there is deep commercial culture, atomistic commercial culture, war cannot solve the problem even. Sorry, I don't want to do it. I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I think that's a serious charge. I mean, uh, we hear him say in the lectures on fine art, right, that no war between European states could be world historical anymore. Um, but I, I, I don't see him saying, or I don't know whether he thinks that a war as such could no longer play a world historical um, role. And I think, but I think that if you're right, um, this is a serious problem for the notion of the state as a basic unit, right? Because it looks like um, he thinks that it's logically necessary that basic units be able to understand themselves kind of in existential contrast to other such units. And so if we kind of like eliminate that part, um, I, yeah, I, I guess I agree with you that we, um, we, we no longer have kind of like the most coherent basis for asserting uh, the independence of rational organisms. Thank you. Thank you. It does hang on that. Okay, uh, next in line is Stephen Hulgate. Yes, hi there. Apologies for keeping my camera off. I'm just exploding in fits of coughing every now and then, so you don't want to see that. Anyway, I really enjoyed that. And I wanted to ask, picking up the, the point about the division of powers, ask um, a very kind of small question uh, that might be also a little bit cheeky from a, a, a transatlantic point of view. Um, okay, in paragraph 269, Hegel associates the organism uh, of the state with the political constitution. But then if we go to paragraph 272, where he fleshes out what the constitution, political constitution, should look like, yes, he talks about the division of powers, but he also says significantly that each of these powers is the totality and that each, as it were, contains the other within itself. Now, in the country in which Bob and I live in, that's fulfilled because the executive is represented in the legislature but where you guys live it's not fulfilled you have quite a sharp distinction between executive and legislature so i guess what's interesting there is that we've got a quite a practical and very specific consequence of the organic theory of the state which is that there are significant differences between the constitutional structure of the US and of certain European states, not all of them, but certain European states. Um, and I wonder if that means, for example, I mean, this is going to be simplistic, and this is why I said it was cheeky, that, 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 that the US in that sense is not an organism. I mean, in other respects, it might be. But, but is that fair? I mean, you focus obviously very much on, on the external relations, but I think Mark highlighted the, uh, the internal ones. And I just wanted to pick up on that and see what, uh, if you have anything to say about that. Um, and I'm not sure that I do. I mean, uh, it clearly uh, the, <laughs> the view that he thinks he is, um, I don't know if attacking, but criticizing is something like the American view, right? Where, uh, I mean, I think one reads in Hamilton and in Madison explicitly mechanical um, metaphors for describing how, you know, these powers are supposed to be impinging and blocking each other. Um, and so, uh, in, in a sense, what we describe in 272, um, it, it makes sense that his emphasis should be on uh, those things, uh, I liked what you said, that are even internal to the different powers that nonetheless uh, uh, allow for a kind of consciousness, you know, of, of the other power within itself, um, maybe... Yeah, I guess I'm interested in... And then, sorry to press this. A little bit uh, what this means. this paper a bit later. What this means for, for American Hegelians interested in political theory? No, I, we have a problem. 
<laughs> I think it's very clear that we have a problem. Uh, that is that, um, uh, yeah, that, I mean, certainly at this point in history, it's become clear that our, our mechanical view of the state as a sort of machine that will take care of itself regardless of the input, uh, you know, uh, it, it does kind of like generate conflicts that it itself cannot mm -hmm. account for, maybe precisely because of what you're saying, yeah. right? That yeah. Yeah. Uh, it it encourages an unself-consciousness about the relation of the parts. So I'm, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I'm I'm, I'm happy Good. to. Thank you for that. And, and just so I'm not appearing smug. I mean, we have our clown as a, you know, as as the leader of our executive. So so I, don't worry. I'm not I'm not saying we're any better than that point of view. But <laughs> thank you very much. Anyway, that was a helpful answer. Thank you, Stephen. I was going to have to ban any further questions that might impugn the dignity of uh, our republic, but now I don't have to. Thanks. Uh, next up is Lydia. Hi, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that paper. Um, I wanted to um, push you a little bit on this question of where patriotism fits in here. Um, so you're, you're talking about patriotism when you ask the question, where and how do states realize that self-conscious status? Um, and you conclude at the end of that paragraph that patriotism is an unthinking identification rather than one in which the state becomes fully conscious of itself. And um, I'm afraid I'm, I'm talking some about other work that I've done on this concept, but I, I think Hegel's description or understanding of patriotism is much more complex than that. And in fact, that it, his description of second nature in this context is really a kind of culmination of different parts of political identity that come that are sort of united under the idea of patriotism but that have to do with the way we recognize each other as members of a state that also includes our membership in things like the family and civil society um, and that patriotism itself was a word that was evolving at the time and could mean lots of different things and i so i had two questions about that one if it were true that patriotism for Hegel is more complex and involves layers of recognition and institutional engagement and understanding of one's political identity, would that help you here? Like, would you say that something like that would actually be the place where states recognize their self-conscious status? Um, or would you still have to include this international level? Um, because part of what struck me reading your paper too is that those two options are so divergent, right? So it's either kind of in my feeling about the state. And again, I think it's more complicated than that. But, um, and then on the other hand, it has to do with the way my state functions in the global political order. and. And so I wondered both um, if you thought a kind of more nuanced idea of patriotism could do the work that you'd like it to do um, and how the, the different levels, very personal and very international work together in your trying to answer this, uh, this very good question. Um, that's helpful. No, I, I think, um, yeah, if you'd send me what you've written on this, I can uh, incorporate it in the final version, but I, Maybe what what causes me to separate them was the thought that um, maybe yeah you're making me realize that this was an unspoken assumption that in order for you know a spiritual entity to be fully self conscious uh, that means a kind of um, I was taking that to be a kind of particular like really elicitation or solicitation of oneself you know with respect to some other and. Um, uh, it it may be that that's that's actually not the right way to think about the you know the self awareness of the state and that Hegel doesn't mean to be in which case um, you know we we wouldn't need to think like I American in order to be doing the work of being a self conscious American um, I think so that I'm happy to concede that that was a kind of assumption that you just made me aware of but. I guess I am interested in, you know, I'm, I'm still wondering like what the connection would be between saying, um, you know, I'm a patriot because I pick up the trash and because I take my kids to school and because I, you know, um, I don't spit on the street and I'm a patriot because I do something on behalf of my country vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And I feel like those things must be connected at some point that I, I can't see that they would have nothing to do with each other. Uh, and 
I'm still sort of tempted to say that the international context is kind of like the, you know, the most brute or most explicit version of that, that kind of thinking. But um, uh, I don't know, do, do you want to say that we can completely dissociate them? Uh, not necessarily. I guess part of what I'm saying is that I think that if we have a more robust understanding of patriotism, there isn't going to be that big a leap between those two. So I, I think that would actually help your point. Um, I mean, I, you're, you're obviously right that most of us on a daily basis don't have a whole lot of uh, say in the way our country functions on the international sphere. Um, but again, it just seems sort of strange to me to say it's either this this very personal thing, this very personal feeling, and that fails, therefore we have to look at the international sphere. So I guess I would just encourage you to, yeah. to think that it would actually be helpful to you to complicate that understanding of patriotism, and, and that will actually make your point, which is already very strong, stronger. No, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to have the reference to your paper for that. Thanks. Okay, Robert Pippin is next. Um, very elegant paper, Anton. Um, my my second question, which I, I would like you to say something about after the first question, is could you say a little bit more about why print-based culture is essential for uh, a, a preview of your, your book, perhaps? What's, what's gone wrong in the conditions for experiencing ourselves organically, in some sense, as part of a whole, thanks to the, the, the less powerful dimension of print in a society. But uh, the first question is to ask you to speculate some more on uh, uh, what it would mean to understand oneself uh, to be an element of, uh, of some kind of living whole in the contemporary context, that is to, to feel oneself, genuinely feel oneself incomplete if uh, one were to imagine oneself separated from this kind of an organic uh, whole. I mean, the, the things that people who are critics of Hegel worry about uh, are things that go all the way back to Aristotle's worries about Plato, that the conception of wholeness in Plato is too much like a family, too much identification, that uh, there ought to be more, I mean, you can see sort of a Hegelian element, there ought to be a more mediated relation among citizens, it ought to be a little more like friendship, a little less like the family and so forth. So uh, people are, are, uh, are concerned that it's hard to get a kind of existential grasp on what that would be in the modern international order and um, in the nature of modern uh, modern states, especially since uh, in 147, when Hegel talks about the principle of subjectivity within the state, he talks about self-feeling, um, that this is an affective dimension rather than anything like rational allegiance in the way we think of the, the, liberal, the liberal state as producing. And the thing I'm worried about is, um, going back to Stephen's question is, is uh, you know, that we're all in uh, so-called advanced Northern European industrial, post-industrial democracies, the crucial Hegel Hegelian distinction between the state and civil society has collapsed. Uh, there, there isn't any more distinction between the state and civil society. To the extent that there's something like what Hegel was talking about, um, a sphere of identification that isn't uh, contractual or um, self-interest rightly understood or um, uh, some other form of transactional need and dependence um, in countries like uh, India, or I would hesitate to speak for Iraq, but in, in Iran or in Japan, um, that identif identif identificatory, if one can make up a word, uh, element is cultural and religious or cultural and or um, religious uh, rather than national political. Uh, so even the notion of the nation state, is not state centric. Uh, you know, it presumably would include Hindus everywhere or something like that as, you know, needing to come home and the problematic case of Israel, of course, uh, being on everyone's mind, um, where one can get a much more existential sense of what it would be to feel oneself to be part of a whole, but in, in complex, uh, globally trading, migration, problematic, contemporary societies, is it really even worth considering political, since we can't reestablish an organic whole, it's not, it's not something that could be the object of political will. W would you agree that it's a, a sort of world historical fact that the model of organic belonging for the state is um, a fantasy, that, that uh, there, there are no conditions that would make that 
even reasonably plausible, except conditions that we would find not really political and quite dangerous. I feel like you're you're nudging me towards what you described yesterday as option one. Well, we, uh, we, we <laughs> leave that out of it. But certainly in this in this regard, uh, if yeah. that's what's necessary for there to be a vibrant political life in a modern state, then we are well and truly screwed. Yeah. No. I mean, um, I think um, one can both concede that you know that there's too many as it were, forces that are eccentric to the state now to really think of the state as, you know, the fundamental unit of effective life. But, um, uh, I mean, the only thing I want to add is that we, we seem to nonetheless live in states and, uh, and we will only do so to the extent that people are willing to think of themselves as inhabitants of states and potentially willing to you know sacrifice themselves on behalf of their states and the day when uh when i don't know preponderance of people cease to do that then there will cease to be you know hegel says germany is no longer a state in the german constitution uh, at, at some point like we might wake up and discover that we no longer live in states but um uh, to me, that only points to the, the kind of political problem of, you know, living in um, in a kind of unit of social life that's so far from the units of cultural, imaginative, effective life, uh, without a real alternative to, um, to 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 for it to develop into or for it to, uh, without a determinate negation, as you put it yesterday. Um, so I. I I concede the problem, but I think um, uh, the solution isn't just to say, well, this is a fantasy and it always was. I, I mean, I think that the, the problem is both that you are right and that we nonetheless live in states and have to and have to think of ourselves as such. And um, part of my suggestion is that Hegel is giving us kind of like a, a brave attempt way of thinking of that. Um, but it's nonetheless clear that we've drifted farther and farther from the possibility of envisioning ourselves as effectively uh, constrained by or bound to, you know, this thing that we call the state. And I think a lot of it does have to do with, uh, you know, this, the second point that you started with that, you know, Lydia in her paper brings up Benedict Anderson and the notion of the nation state as having emerged into being through a kind of uh, imagination of, others reading and writing and circulating, you know, these printed uh, texts, right? And uh, part of the reason why the state seems so implausible to us now is that our texts are everywhere, or there's no constraining medium that shapes our imagination to uh, a kind of like regional or state unit. Uh, but yeah, I think that only makes the situation more tragic, as it were, or the decision more stark. <laughs> Yeah. I, that's what you meant about printed. If, for you, the circulation of these kind of printed documents is essential to a, a common literacy about oneself as a state citizen or? Yeah. Is that what yeah. you meant? And that, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that can't be done virtually or uh, on screen. <laughs> I mean, what is it about print? Def definitely not. <laughs> what is it about print? Yeah. Um, Instead of uh, ones and zeros. I mean, I, I think the, the helpful question in Anderson is how do I imagine others when I encounter them within a certain medium, right? Like, what do I imagine that I share with others? And uh, at some point, the state either came into being or helped itself into being through the thought that I was, you know, like the other people I was reading and writing for. And that. Um, kind of like bounded imagination is what's, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's certainly gone. That's certainly gone, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Just stay that's off right. Facebook. Stay off Facebook and the organic state. That's right. Stay off that's Facebook right. and the organic state might come back. <laughs> In 100 Readable. years, but yeah. <laughs> 400, maybe 400, maybe 500. We're that's down right. to about four minutes for the remaining three questions. So we're going to move on to Robert Stern. I always just get four minutes. I'm going to get good at this by the end. Right. Here we go. Um, so this is a rather deflationary question or point. Um, and that 
are we rather overdoing the organicism in Hegel? So if you look at the philosophy of right, the only places where org organism seems to get mentioned is in relation to the constitution. So in effect, that's the sort of point Stephen was making, that he thinks the constitution has to have this interdependent interdependent structure. Other notions of organicism, particularly the sort of things that are worrying Robert, for example, I mean, they're, they're later, well, they're more earlier ideas. In the Hegelian tradition, they're later ideas. People like the British idealists get very excited about the idea that the individual is a, is a part of a whole and can't be removed from the whole, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a Hegelian tradition of organicism, but is that Hegel's fault? <laughs> I mean, I, the point I'm trying to make is that, well, no, we, you know, we've gone overboard on the way, if we look at carefully the way Hegel uses the metaphor, it's very limited and rather um, modest in a certain way. Is that, does that seem a reasonable point or do you really think that there is a much deeper, and you can leave aside the system program because that was written by who knows what crazy adolescent sure, sure, sure. knows when, no. right? <laughs> but in, in the mature Hegel text, particularly the philosophy of right, where's the organicism in any very ambitious sense? It's just a claim about the, the constitution. Um, I mean, I I think I want to contest the just in your last sentence, right? Uh, what would it mean to really think about uh, the constitution as the kind of whole that we need it to be for it to be not, um, uh, not subject to the problems of liberalism and um, uh, have it be sort of like restricted to the constitution? I mean, I think you're but right. But it's, most a huge of jump. it's a huge jump from that to thinking we might end up in Robert's, you know, mystical uh, organicist community where we're all, I mean, you know, there's a huge stretch from one to the other. There's a lot of space in between. Um, yeah. Um, uh, I, th no, I, I mean, I think in general, I, I agree with the thought that we don't, we don't need the, the organic state to be kind of this place of unthinking, you know, pauper-like identification, and that's not how it shows up in the text. But I, I would also think that um, the, um, the problem to which it's a solution, uh, it's, Hegel doesn't just say, well, we have a kind of uh, general basis for unity that liberals don't take into consideration. I mean, he does develop the sense that, sorry, go ahead. Well, I mean, again, it's just the constitution has an organic structure. That's all he says. Now, the result of an organic structured constitution is going to be an overcoming of various tensions between the individual and society of various kinds. But the result of yeah. that needn't be anything like an organism. <laughs> so, so the you organic don't metaphor that the... doesn't... Doesn't, anyway, I'm sure I'm over my four minutes. No, 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 no. I'm um, myself. You don't think it carries over to the notion of like the Germanic people, for instance, at the end of the book, or, uh, you know, the sense that there are these world historical units that we might be able to identify as coherent and autonomous? Um, well, again, if you look at 259, I mean, the, the organic metaphor is partly used, or the organic notion of the, of the constitution is partly used to introduce the idea of a genus to which that yeah. state belongs. Yeah. Um, but again, that hasn't got anything, it doesn't have the, um, yeah, so the sort of overly communitarian <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. connotations that... Yeah. that that many, I mean, again, the British idealists loved all that stuff, right? I mean, that, that was their big spin on, on all this. They wanted that end of Hegel. But yeah, where, is it in Hegel? I don't know. We go on to the next one. All right, Jonas. Thanks, um, and thanks for your, for your talk, which I um, enjoyed very much. I have a, a question um, regarding the concept um, of life um, in respect to the distinction and relation between state and state on the one hand and civil society on the other hand. And so I was um, thinking um, of Joachim Ritter, who uh, had claimed that um, Hegel um, has identified 
um, the historic feature of society um, as being conceived of as non-historical, as um, natural, as being based upon the, the natural needs and as being self-regulating, like life. So, and um, on the other hand, so um, there is the state, which is political, historical, um, and in some way not natural. And um, so, and this distinction became then then influential for liberalism that is, that the civil society is living self regulation um, organic in some way, and the state on the other hand is political historic and um, regulating in a non um, living way. And so I I'm wondering what where this leaves us in in regard of of your talk um, when the organic or living um, or both. Um, concepts come in on the on the side of the state as well, and, and not only on the side of um, of the civil society. So does this then mean that um, the state is organic, but in some way not living? And on the other hand, the, the civil society is living, self-regulation, but not organic. Um, and so it's pretty much as well um, a question about the two words in your title, um, organism and life, how they relate to each other. Thanks. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I can't actually think of a passage where Hegel makes some kind of clear distinction between like just living and organic. Maybe someone can correct me. Uh, but, uh, it's interesting that, you know, right. You could, part of my motivation for the paper is thinking that a form of, we, we're very comfortable speaking about forms of life. But as soon as the word organic comes in, it feels like you have a self-contained and potentially antagonistic form. And so it, it does feel like one is adding something, even though I'm not sure that, um, you know, that, that that is entailed necessarily. But uh, um, yeah, I, I mean, part of the question is what Hegel thinks of as life here, right? And uh, and And why he thinks that like all spiritual forms are higher expressions of life and not just, uh, yeah, not just conventional or historical, but that because in the context of world history, that there is a progression and development then we want to call, we want to say that spirit is alive and that spirit takes these forms and therefore that these forms are organic. But I don't have a good way kind of like of distinguishing the life from the organic within philosophy of right. Uh, did you have something in mind for that? Or? No, uh, I was asking because I, I didn't have, and, but I was wondering um, whether this, um, what this means for, for state and society as well, if you can see something um, there um, regarding this. If you claim that the state is organic, what, where does this leave us for um, thinking of how Hegel thought of, of, the, um, of civil society? Is this then not yeah. um, not organic um, because in some way it seems like he um, says that mm. it is organic as well but maybe in a different non-self-conscious um, way or so mm. yeah no i mean you're making me think that uh, one could say that you know the market is alive let's say right i mean there is a, a dynamic of exchange and self-interest that is um you know emergent in the way that the invisible hand is um and that 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 is a kind of alive thing or feature of civil society but yeah i guess you're making me see that the thing that makes it organic is once you think of it in the context of a certain unit which includes the state which in turn is a response to the problem of what keeps civil society and the state you know one one thing or one basic uh yeah unit in contrast to others and uh i think you're right that it's at that point that you know as robert uh, stern was saying uh it's at the point of the constitution that the organicism really seems to enter in earnest uh, but yeah that's okay and our, our last question is from pavla jovanovic hi thanks uh th thanks for your paper and, and your talk and uh th thanks to everybody for um this uh, really interesting uh, three three days. 
So I guess my question was going back to the first question by, by Arash and this, uh, this uh, notion of war and its importance to Hegel's theory of the state. So insofar as I understood the, the kind of problem Arash was trying to highlight is that, um, let's say premise one, Hegel's theory is, pre is uh, Hegel's theory of the state uh, implies that war is somehow important either for the formation and or sustaining of, of states. Uh, premise two, war has been made impossible by technological development, nuclear proliferation, and so on. And so conclusion, Hegel's theory of the state no longer applies in, in some way to, to our current predicament. So this made me think of another sort of more contemporary version of this idea that war is important to the, the for state of, the formation of states. And what I, what I was thinking of is Charles uh, Tilly's uh, coercion capital in European states. And so basically the idea here was that war is, the, the threat of war um, is a pressure for the state to rationalize in order to make itself more efficient at waging war. And so uh, the threat of war sort of imposes an almost kind of game theoretical obligation to states to rationalize. And so to, to, to my reading of, of this, uh, Charles Tilly's, um, theory is that historically war has been this, this threat which, which has driven this process, but really what's doing the theoretical work here is a more general notion of competition between states. And historically this competition has manifested as war, but perhaps it doesn't have to continue manifesting as war in our current situation. So I guess my question was just, to what degree do you think that war specifically is important for Hegel's theory of the state? over and above us uh, non-military forms of competition, you know, economic competition, perhaps cultural competition of some sort or something like this. Thanks. I think, yeah, the reference to Tilly is, is helpful. It's the, the jingle that I always remember is like, uh, this war makes the state, the state makes war, something like that. Um, um, I mean, it, it seems to me like, uh, Hegel thought that the, you know, the, the utmost or, you know, existentially explicit uh, situation of competition is war. But, um, you know, I think your question is, uh, is important in that, you know, to the extent that we still think that we live in states and that war is impossible or suicidal or undesirable, uh, we yeah, maybe we can identify other kinds of competition. I mean, I, um, I don't know how to answer except, you know, by thinking of, let's say, Russia or China vis-a-vis -vis the United States, right? Like, it's clear that the United States is engaged, you know, in other forms of competition with these states. Now, isn't it only engaged in these forms of competition in the way that it is because there's this kind of, like, backdrop that we must not approach namely, you know, nuclear war. So I, I wonder whether, um, yeah, the thing to say isn't like, that, yeah, there's, there's an imperative or a high, you know, incentive to engage in other forms of competition, but they're nonetheless not unconstrained by the possibility of nuclear war at any moment. And that, that seems to me a little differently from just saying, you know, war is obsolete. Now we will find out what world historical principles are on the basis of you know, who has the better app or who can uh, control data better or something like that. Uh, so I, I, I want you to be right, but I can't help but think that it's still a hybrid situation. All right, well, thank you, Anton, for a great presentation. Thank you, discussion. thank you all. We will return in five minutes. So by my clock, that means uh, 2.05, 2.04 uh, for uh, Lydia Mullen's paper.